The topic is Models for Interpreting Ecosystem Change. We have Dr. Anna Richards today, especially here. Um, she's a plant and soil ecologist and a senior research scientist at the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, CSIRO, based in Darwin. She has a broad interest in ecosystem management, particularly how the science of vegetation and soil dynamics, along with land management practices, can be used to better monitor, evaluate, and forecast ecosystem conditions. So Anna has also been facilitating and supervising PhD students from Rio and also postdocs. And we are very happy to have her here today. So Anna, welcome, and the stage is yours. Thanks, everyone. It's a shame I didn't get the overflow room. I'll go down there. <laughs> um, I'd also like to um, mirror what Raphael said and, and pay my respects to the Larrakia people as the traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting today and, um, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, I'd also like to say this presentation is the work of many people. Um, there's a very large team of us that worked on um, something I'm calling the Regional Ecosystem Account Pilots Project. Um, and I'll tell you a bit more about that in the next slide. So I'd just like to acknowledge my co-authors and I'll mention them throughout the presentation as well. Okay, so the Regional Ecosystem Accounting Project was a project that we um, ran in um, from May uh, 2022 to December 2023. It was in collaboration with the Department of uh, Climate Change, uh, Energy, the Environment and Water. Um, it was designed to develop ecosystem accounts that could meet end user needs, which were the policy and program areas in DECU um, and DAC, Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry. And the project developed ecosystem accounts for two areas in Australia, the Western Australian Wheat Belt and the Flinders, Norman and Gilbert River catchments. And given we're in Northern Australia, I'm just gonna focus on the Flinders, Norman and Gilbert River catchments part of this work for the rest of the talk today. And there was also a sister project in this, um, in this whole umbrella of, uh, of work in the Murray-Darling Basin as well. Uh, just to give you a, a background to the Flinders, Norman and Gilbert River catchments, they're up there in, in North Queensland coming up the Gulf of Carpentaria. The catchments together form an area of around 200,000 square kilometres. Um, the rainfall um, changes from uh, west to east from 490 to about 700 millimetres of annual rainfall per year, so a bit drier than Darwin. Um, there's a range of different vegetation communities and big rivers, lowland rivers in this region. Um, so some of the main ones are acacia woodlands and shrublands, and these are a lot of um, lancewood and also gigi um, acacias. Uh, there's eucalypt woodlands, so it's more savanna systems like we have up here, as well as big um, floodplain forests and woodlands. And um, there's mutual grass, tussock grasslands, um, there's Malaluka forests and woodlands. Uh, there's some mangrove and salt marsh areas along the coast there up near Kurumba. And there's some small areas of Palestrine wetlands as well as the rivers and streams. Um, so before I begin, I'm, I'm just going to step right back and give you an, uh, an introduction to ecosystem accounts so we're all on the same page. I think we're probably all on the same page at that top point. So ecosystems, they're groups of plants and animals and microbes interacting within a particular climate and landscape. And then ecosystem accounts present environmental, social, cultural, um, economic information about ecosystems and which provide a range of ecosystem services that our wellbeing and economy depend upon. So the key concept of ecosystem accounts is a production of a coherent set of information that can have many potential applications. So it can be used for environmental monitoring and evaluation or policy and program evaluation, for decision support and analyzing trade-offs. But they really only become useful when you combine them or integrate them with other pieces of knowledge. So um, the accounts produce a coherent and standardized set of information and then you need to integrate them to, um, to produce in, uh, information that might be useful for a particular question that you have in mind. Um, to produce the accounts, we use a standard called the System of Environmental Economic Accounting, Ecosystem Accounting, you can see it there. And the accounts are always a, a past to present um, piece of information where they're produced. And when you produce an account, it needs to be spatially complete for an area of interest. Um, this is what we call the ecosystem accounting pathway. It's sort of the overview of, of what goes into an account. 
there's the first thing you tend to do is describe an asset size and type. Um, and we call this an ecosystem extent account. And you might talk about the condition of that asset. Um, and that's uh, we call ecosystem condition. And that's um, another term for that is ecological integrity. And I'll go into a bit more definition of that later. Uh, we can develop ecosystem services accounts, and these can either be physical stock and flow accounts or monetary accounts. Services might include things like climate regulation, which will be describing carbon sequestration and storage. It might be food provisioning services, recreation services, and so forth. And then some of the benefits might be healthy communities, a healthy atmosphere, rural livelihoods. Um, and these can be valued using monetary and non-monetary valuation techniques. Um, here's a version two we made that looks a lot more complicated. Um, we just put some more arrows in there just to show that there's quite a, um, not a linear relationship between all those components, but you can use information that you uh, use to describe your ecosystem extent, for example, in uh, your calculation of flow of ecosystem services, or information that uh, goes into your condition calculations that also might inform a biodiversity account, which is a, an account that sits outside that, um, that main flow of the ecosystem accounting pathway, um, but it's one that we did explore in this project. And one thing I really, is the key point of ecosystem accounts is that they measure the ecosystem's contribution to producing an, an ecosystem service. And I like this example because it, it's easy to get in your head. So the, if you look at the middle photo there, there's a, a recreation service that these two people are experiencing where they went to Kurumba and they, um, had a wonderful time fishing. Now there's um, two parts to that service. One part was contributed by that healthy ecosystem, um, the mangrove forests and salt marsh and estuarine systems that are um, up there near Kurumba. But there's also a contribution from society, the boat ramp that allowed them to access those um, estuaries, the um, caravan park where they could stay. And so ecosystem accounts petitions out the ecosystem contribution to that particular service. So it doesn't just measure the whole service, it, it actually has to um, measure that part. Um, accounts information comes in many different forms and can have different applications depending on what form you use. So you can have a whole bunch of um, tables um, and you can go to the Australian Bureau of Statistics website and you can see what some of those look like and they have particular applications. Behind those tables, of course, is um, account ready, what we call account ready data. Often this is um, continuous time series information. It might be um, gridded information. It might be spreadsheets and so forth. And that can be um, used for another set of applications. And then there can be source data as well that feed into that account ready data. Um, so this might be in its, its native resolution and, um, and, and a native time series. So that's um, how Ecosystem Accounts 101. I wanted to go back and revisit the title of my talk, which is about conceptual models. Um, and the reason we're doing this is we want to see how we wanted to test in this work how we use or integrate conceptual models with the concepts of ecosystem accounting. So conceptual models are simple descriptions of systems to aid communication and understanding. And we've been developing a lot of these over many, many years. And um, as part of this work, we visited the Flinders, Norman and Gilbert River catchments and uh, ran a workshop with um, local based experts to describe something called a state and transition model um, for ecosystem types in that region. And this was guided by something called the Australian Ecosystem Models Framework, which some of you might have heard me bang on about for years. Um, there's those experts in the room. The Australian Ecosystem Models Framework is a consistent way to describe ecosystem change that alters ecological integrity. Um, it allows us to differentiate between change that's part of a natural dynamic to which ecosystems have adapted over thousands of years from that change, which is uh, causing changes in the characteristics of ecosystems leading to a, a, a reduction or alteration to their ecosystem condition and the flow of services that come from those ecosystems. And this is useful for as a basis for making decisions around land management um, for multiple values. The other reason we've put together this framework um, was to synthesise the deep observational uh, knowledge of ecosystem scientists, land managers and others in a consistent way before this knowledge is lost. So a lot of our information that we have on the way our ecosystems function and, that, and how they function in, um, in their best condition um, has been observed on the ground and not written up in scientific publications or reports. And so it was, it was gaining that information and synthesising it at a place where it can be accessible to everyone um, was an important aspect of developing this framework. 
Um, the key part of the framework are two um, models. The first one they're called archetype dynamic ecosystem models. And these are a set of reference models um, for Australia. They've been developed with more than 100 experts in Australia. Uh, there's 44 models at the moment, so they're very high level. Um, but they describe the disturbance and biomass recovery dynamics for ecosystems that display integrity. That is the dynamics to which ecosystems have adapted. Often when we describe these models, we're describing systems that we no longer observe in nature. Um, they include anthropogenic and non-anthropogenic actions that maintain ecological integrity. These archetype models provide a template for describing what we call state and transition models. State and transition models include a reference state, and so the archetype provides a template for that reference state, and modified states um, that are um, manifest as a result of contemporary transformative disturbance regimes. Um, you'll see lots of boxes and arrows on this diagram, including all those little green boxes, and we call those expressions. These uh, just capture that transient variability that we observe across space and time in our, our ecosystems in response to, for example, fire or drought or flood regimes that don't cause a transition to another state so that those um, disturbance regimes are, um, maintain an ecosystem within that. So here's just a, um, a slide that my colleague Megan Good um, helped put, me, put together for me. This is one of her state and transition models on, on the right. Um, and it's just a nuts and bolts of state and transition models. So here I've removed those green boxes just to make it less confusing. So each of those black boxes there are an ecosystem state. Um, we always have a reference state in these models and then modified states. Each of those modified states groups common types of modification in our environment relative to a reference. Um, they'll have unique combinations of information on structure, function and composition. Um, an ecosystem state is often resilient to disturbance, so it can maintain its organisation under perturbation. However, certain drivers will lead to a transition, the arrows in this diagram, which is a pathway through which ecosystems pass from one state to another. And this is irreversible without active management intervention or long time frames. And you can characterise these arrows with drivers, um, probabilities, and So here's some um, ecosystem types in the Flinders Norman and Gilbert um, River catchment. And so we use that concept of state and transition models and the framing in the Australian Ecosystem Models Framework to develop the conceptual models for each of these ecosystem types. There are actually many more than this. I think there are about six or seven. Um, I've just shown three up here as an example. So each of these ecosystem types correspond to an archetype um, model. And we have these, I should have said, they're um, published in booklets. Um, you can download them for the web. They'll have a, um, a box and arrow diagram and you have some text and photos. And so you can use that and we bring them to the workshops to articulate um, a reference state for each of these ecosystem types. Um, once they've experts have, we've worked with experts to describe the reference, um, they then um, describe ecosystem states or ecosystem condition states, if you like, um, because they are departed from reference um, for that landscape. So here's some examples of three states, ecosystem states, um, that sit within um, something that we call the tussock grasslands archetype model. It's actually got a longer name than that, but I couldn't put it on the slide. Um, so you've got a, a reference state, areas in, in good condition. You've got areas which have very low density of perennial grasses. They're missing grazing sensitive species. And then you've got um, areas with acacia nylotica, so um, prickly acacia, which is a, a non-native um, species that comes into these grasslands and causes thickening. And then each of those states has obviously transient variability within it over space and time. And this is captured by what we call ecosystem expressions. And you can see three expressions that you would expect to see in a reference. And this is really important for um, things like mapping where these states are in the environment. So when we when we observe our environment from space or from the ground, we see quite a lot of change over time. And so these expressions allow us to identify when that change is part of what we would expect to see in that ecosystem state or when that change is a result of a transition to something else. This is a bit horrendous, so I didn't put it up in the last diagram, but this is an example of those, um, what I showed before, but just blown up into one of those ecosystem states. This is a close to reference state. You can see all the expressions in that particular state. 
Um, you can see a lot of text there. Um, there's a color code of what the different arrows mean. Um, you can go online and download all the conceptual models that were produced by experts. Um, so there's a bunch of these um, for each of the ecosystem types. They include um, text, photos, um, a spreadsheet of data, which is information for each of those boxes. It tells us canopy cover or ground cover, dominant species and so forth. Um, and that's all publicly available. I'll send you the links. I'll have the links up at the end. So why, why did we use these conceptual models or how could they be used in accounts and then elsewhere? Um, there were several reasons that we went down this pathway. It was a mechanism for gaining local expert knowledge input into accounts. It enabled the production of coherent accounts from extent condition to services. We use these as a basis for ecosystem classification, which improved the coherency. Um, it was allowed us to package detailed information about ecosystems in a way that um, was conceptually consistent. So what are the attributes of structure, function, and composition of our ecosystems that sit, sit together um, as, a, as a, a coherent package for that? Um, it allows us to interpret ecosystem accounts in an ecologically meaningful way, including drivers of change. And it, it, it was flexible enough. Um, they're quite flexible, they're conceptual models, so we, they, we can get differences of opinion in there and other things. And that allowed us to align these or, or make sure they're aligned with other classification systems. Um, so the first point on there was that they provide a mechanism for local expert knowledge input. But often accounts are produced um, in very broad areas, which means they need, they rely on information from remote sensing or from broad surveys um, or from models. And these data sets are often national or landscape scale information. So the state and transition model work um, that we used for account interpretation allowed a link between local understanding in that particular region to these large landscape scale national data sets. Um, this is the, um, the process that we went to to produce the accounts and where those conceptual models fit in. So we started with the templates. These were the archetype models that I talked about earlier. Then we ran an expert workshop. Um, this is a, a two-day workshop where we described the ecosystem states and expressions um, for the pilot region. We also um, had a, a project within this, um, in this work um, which was working with Indigenous um, First Nations organisations in the regions we were working um, to understand a First Nations perspectives on how First Nations knowledge and values may be included into accounts. And so um, we wanted to, or we sought to see, seek recommendations of how we could improve the way ecosystem accounts and conceptual models might be done in the future so that they might better reflect um, and respect First Nations knowledge and values. And that's what those dotted arrow lines meant. It's our future aspiration, how First Nations led input into this process. Um, the conceptual models, which is that big box in the middle, then provided a set of rules that we could use to interpret remotely sensed imagery and other data sets that we had for the region to map the location of those ecosystem states and produce an ecosystem account. And that's what I'm going to talk about that bit. So the conceptual models form the basis uh, for the classification of ecosystems in an ecosystem extent account, where extent, um, this is a CAE definition, is the size of ecosystem assets classified by ecosystem types. So if you look at the stylized diagram on the right, an ecosystem type might be something like a wetland or a nuclear woodland. And then each of those ecosystem types can be um, reported as the extent of ecosystem states. So an example um, on the right-hand side, is the change in shading of colours within an ecosystem type to represent those states. And then a change in the extent of ecosystem states results in a change in condition of an ecosystem type. So remember they're ecosystem condition states. They have, um, and I'll, I'll go into that definition of condition later, but they have different levels of ecological integrity. So that is if an ecosystem state with good habitat condition becomes degraded over time, we'd see a decrease in the extent of good habitat within that ecosystem type an increase in extent of poorer condition habitat within that ecosystem type resulting from an overall decline in condition at the ecosystem type level. So when we developed 
the um, ecosystem accounts for the Flinders, Norman and Gilbert. We mapped the location of these ecosystem types first, those archetype models. And these are usually defined by um, soils and, and climate for a region and assumed not to change in extent over time. So here's an example for those um, tussock grasslands. This is the longer name, rainfall, pulse driven, arid and semi-arid tussock grasslands. Um, we mapped the location of, of these grasslands using information from regional ecosystems in Queensland and the National Vegetation Information System. Once we located those ecosystem types, then we had these rules that were defined through that expert elicitation process, the expert workshop, to locate ecosystem states within that type. Um, so you'll see, for example, we use the woody, non-woody sparse, woody layer from the NCAS to define some of the woody thickening areas. Um, we used the GA, Geoscience Australia fractional cover uh, data sets to look at um, different states that have different levels of ground cover and so forth. Um, so here you can see the outcome of those, um, those rule sets. This is a map of ecosystem extent in the Flinders, Norman and Gilbert, and the, the ecosystem extent is reported by ecosystem types, sorry, it's quite small from the back there, um, divided into or separated into these different ecosystem states. Um, and this is for the financial year 2018-2019. Um, oh, I have a number here. There were 11 ecosystem types. Apologies, I said the wrong number before. And 36 ecosystem states. We couldn't map all those ecosystem states. We have such a range of wonderful remote sensing imagery, but it can't really tell us if something's weedy or not in the understory. And so um, some of those states that were only one of the key characteristics or key indicators was the presence of um, non-native perennial grasses like buckle grass um, couldn't be distinguished from states that had native perennial grasses with the data sets that we had. We have the rules there and we have that conceptual model information. So should we get some amazing remote sensing technology in the future that can tell us about species, then there's, a, there's an opportunity to, to rework this. Okay, here's what an extent account looks like if you went, went um, and had a look through some of the information that we've produced. There are generally tables. Um, they'll, gen they'll usually have an opening and a closing date. Um, in this case, we produced all the accounts with an opening date of the 1st of July, 2018, the closing date, of the 30th of June, 2019, so one year, which in ecology is a very tiny amount of time. So we don't see lots of change in these account tables um, given the, that, that one year change. Um, here are presented an extent account slightly differently to one you might see um, where I've put an ecosystem type column and I've added in this ecosystem state column. So you can see the extent of those different states from ones that are fairly close, uh, fairly close to reference, so high condition, um, to ones that are at lowering condition. I've got something there. So increasing departure from reference. So you'll see there's no change in the extent of this particular ecosystem type between the opening and the closing, and all the change is is um, shown in this um, the extent of these ecosystem states. And I should note there's uh, there's not one here. So. Um, in these tussock grassland areas, we didn't have any areas of cropping um, or cleared infrastructure areas, but in some of our other ecosystem states we did, and we include that as an, sorry, but some of those other ecosystem types we did, and that's included as an ecosystem state as well. So we include all the, all the change right through to a car park, if you like, within an ecosystem state description. Okay, so all the changes that we observe in this column, the additions and the re reductions in extent, are all changes in the extent of ecosystem states resulting from those transitions, which are due to the actions of people in contemporary times. Um, in a separate case study where we uh, worked on the, in the Murray-Darling Basin, we were actually able to map the extent of ecosystem expression, that transient variability within ecosystem states. And that gave us an indication of change in that landscape that wasn't a result of um, transitional disturbances. Um, and these could be something we could call unmanaged change. And you can see those sometimes in accounts as well. Um, you can include that information. And lastly, I wanted to point out that when you combine information in the condition account with this information in the extent account, we can interpret why we saw a change in condition of this ecosystem type over the past 10 years in the Flinders, sorry, past 18 years in the Flinders, Norman and Gilbert region. So that um, it was a 10% decline in condition 
And you can see there was a, a reduction in the amount of close to reference tussock grasslands in that region. And I'll go into how we interpret that next. So here's the state and transition model that experts came up with. Um, it's showing some of those states you saw in the table, but with photographs here. Um, and these lines represent the transitions. So they're telling us the drivers of change in this region. Um, these, this is the close to reference state. We call it close to reference. It's missing a lot of its um, fauna species that no longer persist in this environment, for example. It also has a few exotic species. So it's not, it doesn't actually reach the definition of, of um, reference and fraction you know, over in the region. Um, and then many of these other states were a result of alterations to fire and grazing regimes in the region. And so we can see, um, for example, from the accounts across that year, there were 27,052 hectares of the close to reference state transition to the low density native perennial grass state um, due to um, um, grazing above carrying capacity for that state and also alterations in fire regimes. So this kind of information, if you like, gives us an ability to interpret the change in the numbers in the accounts, both in the condition and the extent accounts. And this is important information if we want to make informed decisions about future land management actions in the region, for example. Um, so there is some flexibility um, in reporting ecosystem extent to match with other classification schemes, which might be um, useful to, to do. Um, so having a robust conceptual framework for ecosystem accounts assists with translation to these other classifications. So here is a classification or a, a table of ecosystem accounts reported by a different classification system, which is the, called the CIA, uh, uh, well, actually it's called the Global Ecosystem Typology and it's adopted by the System for Environmental Economic Accounting Ecosystem Accounting. And um, this typology has a set of biomes and within the biomes we have something called ecosystem functional groups. Um, and so we just reshaped the extent of those ecosystem types and states into these functional groups. We did a, um, something called a crosswalk. Um, you can see all those ecosystem states that represent extensive ecosystem modification. So states where you were having crops or plantations or um, infrastructure would go in that orange box. Um, the Flinders, Norman and Gilbert is a region that has um, escaped quite a lot of industrialization and, and change over the um, over time, and so there's only one change or one increase in, in this um, particular functional group over that simple um, time period. And that one hectare came from clearing of something called a pyric tussock savanna. Um, this is an ecosystem functional group that would include the woodlands in this um, area, the acacia and euclid woodlands, the tussock grasslands, um, and the melaleuca woodlands in this region. I'll go back to that diagram. So we've worked through how those conceptual models feed into the ecosystem extent account, um, but they also provide a set of rules um, that can be used to detect, uh, sorry, they provide a, provide a set of rules that can be incorporated into the ecosystem condition account. Um, and what we did is we use these expert, um, this expert knowledge to inform or calibrate the ecosystem condition accounts for this region. Um, I told you I'd, I'd, I'd talk about conditions, so I just wanted to bring up this slide. It's really helpful. I think um, it describes a different way people use the term condition because it gets thrown around a lot and it, it can be quite complicated when people mean different things when they use that word. So in the System for Environmental Economic Accounting, um, the term ecosystem condition is kept as a, an ecocentric way to describe the measure of ecological integrity of an ecosystem or its departure from reference. Um, so there is other ways you might say, um, you might talk about condition for carbon or the condition for grazing or condition for, for birds, um, but that's separate to the way the term ecosystem condition is used in the accounts. Yeah. Um, so when we assess condition, we assess it between a range of of zero and one, um, with one being a, um, an ecosystem that's uh, able to support all the native biodiversity that is expected to occur in that ecosystem. And zero is something where you've extinguished completely all the, um, all the components of that ecosystem, so for example, a car park. And we assess the condition um, as a proximity to reference state. And this work um, was led by Kristen Williams, a 
a good colleague of mine. Um, and she developed these ecosystem condition accounts to understand where condition has changed and also to feed into how, much, how this might affect um, biodiversity in the region. So the way we do this is through um, something called the Habitat Condition Assessment System or HCAS. Um, the HCAS produces a national snapshot of ecosystem condition. It uses the Landsat archive, um, so it's able to produce a condition score from every year from 1988 to 2022. It's now um, will be released at a 90 metre grid. When we did this work, it was still at a 250 metre resolution. Um, it can provide a long-term estimate over 35 years of condition and also short-term um, rolling estimates over three years. And you can also look at trends through time to understand changes in condition over time. Um, we use the HCAS in the workflow for developing ecosystem condition accounts. Um, so um, the HCAS uses remote sensing, and I didn't mention also uses reference sites that can be expert informed. So we got some of the experts in that workshop to inform or provide additional reference sites into the, um, the HCAS. And you can read more about how it, how it calculates a, a departure. Um, I can give you some uh, links to that information. And then what we did is we added in um, information from experts who gave us a condition score for each of the ecosystem states in that model, in the models. And because we had a map of those ecosystem states in the region, we could overlay the map of, the, um, of a condition produced by experts with the habitat condition assessment system. And we combine those two separate lines of evidence to produce the condition account. And if you think about it um, conceptually, so um, the HCAS is viewing things from satellites, which is probably very useful for telling us information about, um, so for example, in wooded systems about canopy condition. And an expert might be viewing condition from a different perspective from, for example, from on the ground. So you might have a better indication of um, uh, ground layer species diversity or fauna, for example, that we can't see from remote sensing. And so the idea was to combine these two lines of evidence for a more robust description of ecosystem condition in the region. And here it is for um, 30th of June, 2019. So the yellow areas in the region are in higher condition um, and in the down towards the um, Flinders catchment, the lower part of the map, um, in the bluer areas, these areas are in lower condition. And we can look at some trends over time. We've just pulled out two of those ecosystem types. One are the floodplain eucalypt woodlands and forests, which are in the green line there, and the other are these tussock grasslands that we've been talking about before. You can see a trend from 2001 to 2018 of a declining condition of both ecosystem types, but a more, more definite decline in those tussock grasslands, which are the highly prized grazing areas in this region. And you can combine that information with um, the distribution of ecosystem states within those ecosystem types to, um, to provide an interpretation of ability to attribute reasons for change in condition over time. Um, we can also look at a trend analysis for that, um, those condition accounts. Um, this is a, um, calculated in terms of condition hectares, um, so it's a similar concept to ecosystem states. And you can see over the 18 years, um, the condition weighted extent or condition hectares, um, it's declined dramatically in many parts of the range of those tussock grassland and also the savanna areas um, with small areas which are showing an improvement. And the last part I wanted to talk about uh, was the biodiversity and ecosystem services accounts. So these accounts take information from the conceptual models that have flown through to the extent accounts and the condition accounts and use that to calculate these other two accounts. Um, so biodiversity is a thematic account in the CEER framework. It's not yet ratified in the standard, um, but the methods and data that we developed in um, in this project were aligned with the developing guidance and international reporting obligations around biodiversity, particularly in the convention of um, the CBD. Um, for the biodiversity accounts, we used a habitat-based approach um, using CSIRO's Bilby Biodiversity Modeling System. And this work was led by Carol McCartney. This produces a spatially complete data set on habitat quality. And that's 
um, drawn in from that conditioned data set that I showed before. And that's then um, used to model expected uh, patterns of biodiversity features, which are informed by um, on-ground records of species observations. And we developed, or Corel developed, two levels of biodiversity counts, a species level biodiversity count, which listed or um, had the habitat for nationally threatened, um, terrestrial threatened species for the region, and a community level biodiversity count, which described the persistence of plants, reptiles, and birds in the region over time. Um, so here's just a what I outlined before. So the biodiversity counts take in information from the um, habitat condition assessment system that's used for the condition accounts and the conceptual models, which describe um, extent of ecosystem states. Um, that goes into a condition layer um, that's then combined with these spatial biodiversity models that model species turnover and richness and produce biodiversity patterns for the region over time. Um, the combination of, of these two um, processes is not additive. So, of course, um, when we do biodiversity accounts, um, you can't just add up the biodiversity in one piece of patch to another one because um, things move across a landscape. And so there's a, a landscape um, connectivity component to compiling these biodiversity patterns. And here's an example for 2018 in the region. Um, they're lucky that Flinders, Norman and Gilbert has actually um, has a lost species, but it's um, in relatively good condition um, compared to many parts of Australia. So the persistence of here showing plant persistence um, and threatened species habitat, um, the, it's a bit hard to tell, but the darker areas indicate the proportion of plant species persisting in this landscape relative to the, the reference and also the amount of habitat remaining for threatened species. The darker, the more habitat remaining. And lastly, and very quickly, I'm not an economist, so um, this work was led by Greg Smith, and I'm, I'm going to go through it quite quickly. Um, there was a, a quite a range of ecosystem services work was undertaken also as part of the accounts. Um, ecosystem services um, look at, at the ecosystems, um, they use information and data um, that also flows into the condition of biodiversity account to calculate um, the flow of, of these final ecosystem services from those ecosystems to the economy. Um, and it's put a boundary in there to indicate that some of those economic units, um, their, their products that are produced are contributed by an ecosystem service, but also by human and manufactured inputs as well. And the idea is to separate the two in the account. Um, I'll just show you an example of those outputs. So in the region, um, there was a carbon sequestration and carbon storage account. And there was also an account on graze biomass provisioning that focused on cattle and calves. And you can see trends over time in those accounts, pretty flat for carbon, an increasing um, uh, provision of grazed biomass over time in the region. And then for the single account year for 2018, 19, you can see the amount of um, carbon sequestra sequestration, carbon storage, the total carbon storage in the landscape and the number of animals slaughtered. And these can be reported by ecosystem types and states. All right, this is the second last slide, but pleased to know this draws all that information together. And going back to that conceptual model, I just picked the classic grasslands again, so you can get a um, good overview of Mitchell grasslands in the Flinders, Norman and Gilbert. This is showing that uh, state and transition model. So these are the ecosystem states here. Um, you've got close to reference. You've got the non-native woody thickening, uh, thickened state. You've got the low density native perennial grass state where you've lost a lot of your grazing sensitive species. You've got a state that's dominated by annual grasses and forbs and uh, one that's dominated by bare soil. Um, you've got the drivers of change between those. And then these little spider plots here relate the information from the rest of the accounts to that conceptual model. So we can see um, the A part on the top of the, the graph indicates habitat condition for each of those states or how departed from reference it is. B is the proportion of um, original threatened species habitat. So when the graph's full, there's, um, it can support a lot of threatened species. Um, C gives us an indication of the amount of carbon stored. This is relative um, carbon stored between the states. It's a relative measure. E is the contribution of that state to the production of cattle and calves. And you can start to see there with trade-offs, obviously, between um, condition of the state and some of these other um, variables or piece of information in the accounts. And F was something I didn't talk about. It was a piece of work that Adam Lee Love did um, 
which is looking at the sustainable capacity for um, cattle and calf production. Um, that's the amount of cattle and calves that could be produced from that ecosystem state without causing a transition to another ecosystem state. It's a slightly different um, concept to the uh, provisioning service in E. So this provides an, some information that can be used by decision um, um, managers that are making land management decisions um, to understand the trade-offs and benefits of different land management actions. So in summary, um, these conceptual models, I hope I've convinced you, might allow a common understanding of landscape and ecosystem change um, to inform regional and national perspectives um, and decision making. Um, one of the critical things and something we've been working on a lot is um, making sure these are developed in a consistent way. So the way that you describe your references that inform your state and transition models are consistent whether you're in Western Australia or Queensland or, or New South Wales. Um, there's many other applications that we've been working on for these conceptual models. I've just shown you accounts here, um, but other areas are um, where we look into the future, um, and that's quite exciting. So you can use these models to uh, think about um, hypotheses around predictions for future ecosystems under different management scenarios. And one of the other key um, questions that we we really, um, I think we need to do more work on, we've done a little bit, but um, it's not enough, press this question, but can Indigenous-led or co-designed conceptual models um, provide a mechanism for facilitating representation of First Nations knowledge and values. And I've got a final slide if you want to. Oh, I'd just like to acknowledge all those experts listed here contributed that expert knowledge into the conceptual models. Um, all of this information is published on um, as data collections if you wanted all the account tables and spatial information. And there's also um, reports. And it's you can access these through a website that I think um, DICU still needs to um, approve it, but it should be approved by December. So I hope we can jump on that link in December and you should be able to download those things. But if you search Flinders and Norman, Flinders, Norman and Gilbert River catchments and accounts, you'll get these um, uh, access to the data and, and the reports as well. That's all. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Anna. Uh, so we can happily start with the questions first in the room, and then we have about uh, 20 participants online. So Hana is going to read the questions later. But are you happy to coordinate the questions? I'm or? Coordinate. Yeah. Oh, all right. Very nice right. ones. Um, so my question is about, can you have you overlay tenure on changes in condition through that area? Well, we, we, didn't, um, we didn't do tenure. So um, when you produce accounts, good questions, then you can break them up in many different ways. So you can report by Ibra regions, for example, in that part of the country. We do report by the river catchments. Um, you can report by different land uses and all sorts of, the Australian Bureau of Statistics often reports by statistical area, which is like a population census um, um, mesh block. Um, but we didn't do land tenure, but you could, you could um, download the data and then, and then have that as a reporting area. Got a tricky question for you. Okay. Uh, um, I'm just wondering if there's not an inconsistency between the way ecosystems are defined and the way ecosystem states are recognised on the other. And the reason I'm saying that is that you've got the definition of ecosystems and it was all the plants, animals, and microbes. Yeah. But the states were defined entirely on the basis of vegetation. And there's there'll be an assumption that order and micro just sort of follow. And I was suggesting that's not the case at all. And I fully appreciate that there's just a lack of order data to see what happens. But it'd be good to see a recognition that if ecosystem states were defined on the basis of fauna, you'd probably get quite a different pattern. And, yeah, and I think people have actually and, tried that. You know, uh, yeah, recognizing that we just don't have the data because it's mm -hmm. so important for us. But it would just be good to see some sort of recognition that it's um, mm -hmm. it's really very much a vegetation based view of the world. And I just noticed all the experts I know, they're, they're plant people. Um, but yes, that, yeah, know, and, and so uh, that, that's what you get. Although we did have no, no, definitely. Yeah, yeah. no, no, for the bottom. No, absolutely, and it's definitely yeah. a good critique. It, it, it's also related to this is um, 
you had the biodiversity box explicitly outside of ecosystems. And you sort of think, well, ecosystems are all about biodiversity, but biodiversity, you know what I mean? And, and I know there's a, there's obviously a practical issue of how you're going to define you know, vegetation, you can measure, or whatever, but at least some sort of recognition that there's challenges there. From, mm. And who knows about what microbes are telling, but from the, just from the fauna perspective, is probably a different story. Yes, I mean, we do ask about fauna as a characteristic of these ecosystem states. We often don't have a lot of information. Um, but what we actually tend to define them by often, so if we think about vegetation characteristics, we usually can't use the compositional information very much either. Um, so compositional information changes so rapidly across the landscape that we're essentially um, defining these states in terms of the the structural components that could support certain species, including yeah. plant species and animal right. species. Um, so a structural and functional components, I guess. Um, so we often get a lot of, and, and it is habitat, and assuming that habitat translates to species, which is probably, I know it doesn't. We often get a lot of characteristics around um, horse woody debris or large trees, hollow bearing large trees and, and things like that. But yes, I do take you, um, but definitely, and it's something that often comes up is a, um, specifically using fauna to develop an ecosystem state transition model might um, generate a different uh, type of model as well. The biodiversity accounts um, is a CR hanger. So they that that they're, they're still working that out, but yes, that's why it's, it was put down the bottom. I would I would think this audio was a tricky question. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, that's mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thanks Anna for the clear explanation of the work that you've been doing and doing at a scale, at the national scale, which is a challenging um, project. As you can imagine, my, my question's uh, focused on aquatic ecosystems. So, and it follows from Alan's in that the, the condition of aquatic ecosystems is not defined by terrestrial vegetation. Mm -hmm. It's the concentration of oxygen. It's the biodiversity and biota that are living in the water. It's normally how we classify the condition or the integrity of, of rivers and, and, and wetlands. Spatial area is there, and I saw that you have wet, you considering wetlands. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just, I guess my question is at the national scale, are you aware of anything that's happening um, to actually be able to assess the condition of aquatic ecosystems? Um, because you can map the extent and you can. Do some things with remote sensing, but there there are, I would argue, that sort of in line with that, what Alan is suggesting that the, the condition of those ecosystems in particular just can't entirely be defined by remote sensing. And so, yeah, are, are the, is there much work happening at a national scale with the condition of aquatic ecosystems? In Europe? So, um, not being an aquatic ecologist, I take that in <laughs> mind. Um, so and I didn't I should have mentioned this. So the, the HCAP provides condition for terrestrial ecosystems only. Um, it doesn't work in um, condition for in channel aquatic ecosystems. So it, it requires that Landsat time series, the remote sensing variables that it uses, are giving you information about vegetation. But there is work underway to to see if there, there is potential to expand that concept of condition into um, lakes, lack like stream areas, um, rivers and streams, um, potentially coastal environments as well. Um, and that would be looking at particular variables that would give us more information about the in, in water um, abiotic variables at this stage. Um, it's pretty hard to get information remotely on macroinvertebrates, um, for example, fish and things, um, and seeing if, if there can be, or they're developing a, a draft method for doing that. So, um, the aim is to get something developed by next. Anna, did you look at management on the ground and management impact? So, in that example, you had a, a loss of condition. And so, did you look at management on the ground so you could tease out whether it was cattle or whether it was climate? Yeah, so that, that's the idea about the conceptual models. So, um, and the expert workshops is to um, to provide some thresholds for some of those um, the variables. Um, I say remote sensing, we had on-ground data sets as well for some of those um, variables. 
to work out when we see a particular change in some of these variables in, in combination with others, when that change is an indication of management, either management that might be um, reducing the condition or improving the condition as well, that's both um, possible, versus a change that's a result of these um, extensive droughts that they got in the region over that time period and so forth. It's not 100% perfect. Um, I definitely think in some of the, the condition um, change you see there, some of that is still picking up some natural climate variability. Um, but the way the, the conceptual basis behind it is that you're, you um, are able to partition out that natural variability from one that is um, driven by people um, undertaking actions in that landscape to change condition for that in or either deliberately or, or unintentional. Um, I agree. It's it's a wonderful um, project and now a great set of tools. But I guess my question is, what next? So how's it going to be used? Is it going to be used for state of the environment reporting or Commonwealth policy on well, various yeah. <laughs> land use change, etc.? Where do you That's see it going? Not there? Place to say. Um, <laughs> no, but just how? I mean, it would be fair to have these wonderful tools and, and it just to be put on the shelf and, you know, things have moved on to some other issue. So yeah, no, it's a good point, Jenny. Um, so I can give you some detail. And one of the things I didn't have time to put the slide in, so there's a lot of caveats. This project was definitely about testing and developing information systems. Um, and the, one of the key objectives to do that was to inform how you might do it nationally. So um, we were asked to use national data sets where we could in developing these accounts to see how applicable that could then be um, these methods could be extending nationally. And we're currently working on um, national ecosystem accounts using some of these methods here. John is very key in, in helping us do some of that work. Um, so they'll be released um, in February next year. Um, so you'll see some of some of the tools and methods that come in here um, will potentially go into those um, accounts. So we're producing the data sets, the uh, spatial and um, other data that goes into accounts, and then the Australian Bureau of Statistics actually compiles and, and produces the accounts. So that'll be published through through that um, mechanism. I suppose a very specific question moving on from that then is, do you see it being used to make decisions about where risk funds could best be put into restoring systems? So you could you could do you could use this data for lots of different. Um, types of questions. So that could be one question, but you need to bring in other information to answer that question. So if you have a question, the accounts provide a comparative snapshot, I guess, of, a, of this, say in this case, this region. It gives you an indication of areas where condition is, is changing or declining over time, um, areas and, and the reasons for that change. And so that might provide some knowledge around um, what actions you might implement in the future. But you'd also want to bring in other, other pieces of information to inform that decision making. But in terms of a, a reporting tool, yeah, that um, I think that is one one place where these accounts and the account information is quite helpful, and then using that that report to then make decisions. Way up different funds. We get one question from the online community. Okay. Uh, this is a question from Lindsay online. Oh. Um, so you mentioned predictive capability. Um, could you say what approaches are being developed to integrate climate and land use change information? Um, yeah, good question, Lindsay. So, um, there's another um, use of these conceptual models. Um, so, you imagine with these conceptual models, you've got a, a generally a hypothesis about how ecosystems change with these different drivers in, in the landscape. And then you can, um, you, could, you can put these models into a simulation framing where um, you can. Um, add information, quantitative information to those transition arrows that describe the relationship between the transition, for example, and a particular climate variable. Um, it might be expert knowledge where you don't have that information that's, or you, know, you might have um, measurements, long-term experiments that could inform that information. And you can then simulate these changes in, in those transitions to different states over time. Um, you can also do that with um, um, information and land use coming into those transition drivers. And people have used that quite a lot, particularly in the in the US, to um, predict um, as a, a large piece of work um, ongoing now um, through the US Geological Survey, where they're looking at um, future land management options in the US and what the implications would be for carbon storage across um, different ecosystems. 
Um, and so that brings in both the climate change and also um, land use change and, and uses these state and transition models. Thank, yeah. Thanks, Anna. I was quite nice to hear uh, to know what's happening in the CS space uh, locally. And um, my, my question is that in assessing that declining or upper, upwards uh, condition of an ecosystem, to that extent, is the main attribute that you're considering or the others as well? That's the first one. The second one was about the reference type. And what you're saying, this is the reference type. Is that going to be consistent throughout the country or that would be different for different places? I don't think the reference one is actually So this, that was the, um, I think that's the key, right? We have to have a consistent definition of reference if you're going to do this in a consistent and comparable way. And so we've worked for a long time to try and get those reference models, get a lot of feedback into them, so that the way um, we describe those dynamics, fire regimes that define these particular um, disturbance-driven dynamics and ecosystems, the, the change that you expect is consistent um, across the country. So, for example, one of the archetype models that we used here was the inland floodplain eucalypt forests and woodlands. So these are river rig, um, um, forests that grow along uh, river systems in central Australia, you would know, or right down the Murray Darling Basin. So, a range of different soil types and rainfall. Um, but the model defines um, from experts the types of disturbance and recovery um, pathways that these ecosystems display in their reference. And so, we, we are using that as an, um, an indication or a template to understanding how our ecosystems are changing and new disturbances come in. So, often when we run these workshops, that that um, that do those disturbance cycles mimic the way ecosystems are now responding to new disturbances. Um, so, for example, in the in the um, the red gum forest, um, we know about the the flood regimes in the um, in the reference, and we know when these um, forests, when they naturally have long periods of inundation, we see deaths of the large red red gums, and we see the more palustrine wetland systems coming about, and you can see that mimicked in a in a modified state that's a result of um, contemporary changes to flood regimes that might might be resulting from damming of, of rivers or um, so forth. Um, and so you, we use these templates in that way to define different pathways of change. And it's probably not, I mean, I'm sure there's, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, and for the condition and extent, um, we use them both together. So um, the, the idea is that if you look at, you can look at changing condition, but to provide more understanding of why that condition is changing, you need information from the extent accounts or, or vice versa. You can see change in ecosystem extent, um, but the consequences of that for ecosystem services requires some of that information from um, the ecosystem condition. What are the key ones for changing condition? Extent is easy, but condition is hard. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so there's many, many different characteristics that can um, be brought into that um, condition index. So it's an integrated index of a whole bunch of different things you're up now that sit underneath. Um, so in the HCAS um, way to measure condition, habitat condition assessment system, it takes in 14 um, remote sensing variables. It, it compares the, um, if you like, the distribution, spectral distribution of those remote sensing variables across space and time for reference pixel. Um, that's matched to the pixel of interest that you want to measure condition for. And so it's looking at the, it's called a generalised dissimilarity model. It looks at the um, dissimilarity between the spectral signatures of pixel of interest compared to that reference 